Fictional Page presents Read Before Midnight, Season 1, Episode 6, The Dive, by W.H. Maxwell, read by the author. A quick word from the author before we begin tonight's episode. First, thank you for being here and returning with us after mid-season break. Your viewership keeps us going. If you want to support us in our stories, please recommend us to a friend. It's the best way to show your support. And now, the dive. The call came in around 4.30. Mr. Corey, Paul, was dying. Tom had expected this. Even more, he had planned for it the last two months. Despite the preparation, however, there was still a sudden shock before the wave of relief set in. Both for Paul and for him. The gear had been prepped weeks ago in a bag by the door. A machine inside, tuned and retuned each day to be ready. He took two of the pills and put the bottle with the rest in the bag. Tom used the last bit of time to leave a quick message on his computer, examining the pictures of Carolyn and the girls for a moment. He poured a double portion of kibble for Lucy and rubbed her ears for a few minutes, kissing her forehead and whispering gently to her as she eyed her bowl patiently. Then he took the bag by the door and left. Tom was at the hospice center in Minister's Creek in less than an hour and ushered through the automatic check-in with a wave of his badge. The hallway was long, tall dark wooden doors mirrored on each side like soldiers on guard. Paul's was the last on the left. Despite the wait, Tom gingered the door open with one hand and set it back softly once through. Bobby was already there with him. This surprised Tom, too, but in a pleasant way. He felt a little sorry for the kid. Tom had picked him for this job, though specifically because he was new to the field and needed the training. He would get his hours in tonight, that was for sure. Everything else that followed, well, Tom could only do his best. Paul was in the bed. His ancient frame withered away to little more than bones and loose pale skin and long white hair. He looked small to Tom. The man who had once been his math tutor as a boy and a fighter pilot in the war before that, a figure once both literally and figuratively larger than life, was now a husk of himself. Tom thought, not for the first time, of baby birds curled up in their nests. You brought your machine? Bobby asked when he saw him. Hey, Bobby, Tom said, putting his bag down and taking off his jacket. Good to see you as well. And yes, I prefer to use my own machine when I go in. It's an older Meridian 97, but she's familiar and reliable. Has been for the last 12 years. Ah, sorry, Tom. How are you doing? Bobby said, standing and giving Tom's hand a squeeze. I've already got the 23 set up, is all. I didn't mean to jump in or anything. I, I just thought it just seemed like the right order to get things going. No worries at all, Tom said, taking out his own Meridian 97 out of the bag and setting it next to Bobby's Model 23. It's good to see you got things going, and we can use the same input-output jack for the linkage and simply swap over the monitors. Do a reset and we should be good. Did you get an ice pack out for the drive unit yet? Yeah, Bobby said, and he began changing out the wires that led from the Model 23 to the monitors on Paul, back to the 97 and refacing the system through his laptop. I've got the hours log running so I can capture the time on this one. Do you mind signing on as well so I can complete the form and log it? It doesn't technically count until there's the second on board. No shakes, I remember, Tom said, and scanned his badge against the machine until it beeped. While Bobby calibrated the devices, Tom approached Paul and put his hand on the older man's with both a familiarity and a tenderness. Soft feathers and brittle bones, Tom thought. The other man was almost 110 years old now, and he looked in the last few weeks as though he had lived every day of it. His longevity was in part due to the genetic vaccines and the button procedure, but Tom suspected that most of it was genetics. When Tom had started Paul's case and they begun treatment two months ago, Paul had still been very lucid and almost the same man he had remembered in his youth. And that's where we were, Paul had shouted at him with enthusiasm only five days ago. Gunning high over the channel and making like hell for France. And Tom, do you hear me? We ducked into the side of this cloud and Jerry was coming in from the other side and it was like thunder up in that storm with all the guns. Worst day of my life, Tom, but the best moment, too, you know? Tom had told him that he did, but Paul had waved it off, saying that he didn't. 
This was what Paul always did, and Tom had laughed it off then. When Tom had been a kid and Paul, a friend of his father's who was known to have gone to university after the war and educated in these sorts of things, had tutored Tom for a year when his math marks had come back poor. At the time, Tom had hated it. Outside, kids would be playing, getting ready for sports, or off on some adventure while Tom had to slog it to old Paul's house. Old Paul, because he had been ancient back then already. And once there, it was geometry, and stories of the war in the sky, and making like hell for France. Once, when a math problem had involved the trajectory of a basketball, Paul had converted the problem to a much more complex one involving aerial raid bombers and how to avoid getting hit. Now, the terrors of social anxiety firmly tucked away in his youth, Tom had come to admire that short breath of time. It was the beginning of an understanding of what an end to things meant, of how time flows and youth ends and spring gives way to the summer of life. Paul's breathing, long and shallow, and slow in the bed before him, was testament to the winter as well, and what was to follow. We are up, Bobby said, looking up from behind the glow of the laptop. Copy that, Tom said, turning back to Paul a final time. You know this guy too, right? I remember from the pre-calibration, Bobby said. Gotta be weird doing a dive for someone you know, right? Tom shook his head. Uh, I wouldn't know, first time. The words bit. Why'd you take the job then? Tom looked away from Paul and back to Bobby again, and thought for a moment, trying to find the right words. He hadn't expected this, and he should have especially in their line of work. But Bobby must have picked up on this, and before he could answer, Sorry, not trying to pry. I I get it, Bobby answered for him. If my parents ever go, or my uncles, and they're on the plan, I'd like to be there for them too. Tom nodded. It worked, well enough anyways, because Bobby had talked himself into it already, and they moved on. The honest truth, Tom knew, was that it was only half because of Paul and the other half was because of Carolyn, and the girls, and because of a group of kids who thought it would be fun to disconnect the autopilot on their car and joyride a bit. Yeah, Tom thought. All that in a bag of pirate booty. When Tom sat down in the chair between Paul and Bobby, he was surprised to see the user interface was already loaded. Not bad for a trainee, Tom said. Do you have Paul synced? Did it right before you walked in, Bobby said still typing into the computer and loading the programs. I appreciate the experience, though. Really, though. Thank you, Tom. You're a natural. Log into your hours and you'll be running dives as good as me or Clancy or Maria. Tom said, placing the halo-like helmet Bobby had set aside for him around the crown of his head. Normally, Tom would have used a more experienced dive partner like Clancy or Maria for a case in Minister's Creek. Bobby was a good trainee, and he meant it when he said the kid was a natural. He really was. It also meant he was less on the uptake for anything outside of normal operating protocol, and would take a little longer with the machines. Or Tom was hoping anyway. All right, Bobby said, standing and placing the other halo over Paul's head. The old man shuddered slightly when he did this, his breathing ragged. We should be good here to dive. Give me 30 seconds to pull up the protocol, and then you are go, Bobby said one last time. Once you are in... I'll give you a call. Let me know you get it, and we'll... I know, Bobby, Tom said gently, closing his eyes. Standard protocol. I'll pick up. We'll be fine. Copy that, Tom heard Bobby say from beside him. Already his training and years of experience were kicking in, and consciousness was pulling back. His body relaxed, and his head swam in a warm feeling momentarily, as the sleep overtook him, and he let himself fall. When he opened his eyes, he was in his childhood bedroom. He was sitting at the little desk in his room, and outside the window, he could see a tree, his tree, dancing softly in a warm summer breeze. Sunlight spilled into the room in sunlit arcs. It was as it always was. Tom stood, taking in the scene with his usual sense of comfort and security. This was part of the training and the job as well. Each diver had a control room, a central location they used to bridge between their minds and the patients, and each was unique and very personal to the diver who used it. Had to be. The diving technique required the use of a strong mnemonic loci, both an intimately detailed knowledge of a space and an emotional connection. 
There was, after a moment, a clap of thunder outside the window, distant but deafening. Tom felt the summer wind chill for a moment, and then the phone began to ring. It appeared on the little table suddenly, an old wireless device that had a plug in base, the kind his mother had used when he was a boy. It chirped there, once and then twice, and then Tom picked it up. Tom, came the voice, deep and whiny. This is Bobby, do you copy? It was Bobby. He was calling to check in on the first rendezvous point. The time dilation between the dive and the outside world, the real world, sounded about two to three times standard. Tom checked his watch, a fancy device that suddenly appeared on his wrist when he thought of it, and checked the dilation interval. 2.7 standard time. He flicked the rest of his stats, all provided into his brain directly via the link from the machine and the sensors on him. When he saw everything looked normal, he responded back to Bobby. Copy that, Bobby, Tom said into the receiver. We are green in here. All stats normal. Tom changed the comm settings on his watch to walkie-talkie mode so that the dilation wouldn't impact the sound coming through. There was then, as a result, a rather long pause before Bobby's next message came through, but at normal speed this time. Good work. Nice, 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 Bobby said through the phone, or at least what Tom thought of as a phone. We should be good to put up a bridge in a moment. Let me know when you have a door. Tom looked naturally to where his bedroom door was, poster of Star Wars pinned up on the back side facing him, as it had been 40 years ago. A moment ago, from the corner of his eye, the door hadn't been there. Now, it stood like a sentinel, standing watch, waiting. Outside, the wind picked up. I've got a door, Tom said. One sec, Bobby said, a small burst of static. Okay, you're good to go. Touch back in on the other side. Copy that, Tom said. Will do. Then he put the phone back into the cradle and looked around again. He did his best to feel through the fabricated, dreamlike nature of it, and take in the way the wood pressed back against his feet, and the smell of the laundry detergent his mom had used. Odd, he mused, how it could all come back like that. He closed his eyes for a moment, trying to take it with him. The wind shifted again and blew in a cold gust with it, Tom didn't need Bobby picking up any irregularities, especially before he'd even made the cross. That would ruin everything, and with Paul in this state, he only had one chance, maybe ever, to get this right. He opened his eyes, crossed his childhood bedroom one last time, if only in his mind, and opened the door. On the other side, the door slammed shut behind him, and he was in a narrow metal tunnel, with a bright cold light casting down toward him. The effect was jarring, not only by what he was seeing, but feeling as well. The hallway was cooler, but vibrating and humming, too. And every so often, a little bump would almost lift him up off his feet. Ahead of him, a familiar voice was shouting, Copy! Do you copy, Tower? We have a whole wolf pack of Jerry's riding up our tail feathers now! Tom began to crouch walk forward, doing his best to stay steady until he emerged into the tight confines of the antiquated airplane. And the pilot seat, strapped in with gear that looked like something out of a history documentary, was Paul. He had one hand on the controls, and the other held tight to the airplane radio. Not only that, Paul appeared far younger than Tom had ever known him, younger even than Tom was now. The radio in the plane crackled, and Paul jumped back in surprise. Tower, do you copy? He shouted. Tom, do you copy? Did you clear the bridge? Came Bobby's voice from the radio. Who in the hell is this? Paul shouted, both surprised and angered by Bobby's sudden appearance on the line. Get off the radio, son! This is a matter of life and death! Tom stepped forward now, dropping down into the co-pilot seat next to Paul, and pulling the radio over to him. Sorry I'm late, Captain, Tom said. Let me man the comms for you, and you can focus on the Jerry's. Paul smiled, a little confused, but clapped Tom on the shoulder. Good to see you, boy. What took you so long? Tom took the radio from Paul's hand and said, All good here, Bobby. He's mid-dive and going strong. How are vitals? After a moment, copy that, 
Not great, Bobby said. Neurotransmitters are spiking hard, so I think you have maybe half hour, tops. After that, he'll go over the edge. Tom sat silent for a second, then said, Copy. I'll ride on through till then with him. Understood. I'll keep an eye out. Keep your ripcord on you and I'll pull you out if he starts to slide early. And with that, another small burst of static and the receiver went dead. We might have lost them, Paul said to Tom. For a moment, Tom was confused, thinking about what was to come, of Bobby back outside in the hospice room, and of Carolyn and the girls. But when he looked up and saw Paul looking out the main window of the plane, looking back, he understood he meant the Jerry's. Uh, I think we'll be all right, Captain, Tom said. The skies look clear. At that moment, however, there was a sudden strafe of sparks as a whirl of gunfire erupted onto the ship. A window next to Tom exploded, and air began blowing through the cockpit like a hurricane. Green shadow and roaring engine passed over the front and top of the aircraft, and Paul began howling like a banshee. The bastards! Paul shouted, and the plane dove down. Tom felt like he would be sick if he could have been. Vomiting in dreams was difficult. Instead, he just felt vertigo as the plane dropped. We'll make it into those clouds there and lose them. Paul pointed to a group of puffy blue-gray clouds outside the window, both beneath and ahead of them. He arced on the stick and pressed the engines harder, banking to the side and laughing. He's having fun, Tom realized in the whirl of things. This was part of how he remembered the thing, too. The cloud engulfed them as the sound of engines pressed in close behind them. Paul leveled the throttle, and the ship rumbled against the strain. Come on now, baby, come on, he said. Still have another hour to go if we can make it past the bastards, or we'll be swimming home. He was shouting over the sound of the engines now, and the rumble of the aircraft, but his voice underneath was not that of a frightful and sick old man in a bed. Instead, he sounded happy, and almost delirious in the moment. The radio burst static then. Tom, you all right in there? Tom picked up the receiver and spoke back into it. All good. Just some weather. What? Bobby's voice came back a moment later. Nothing, Tom said, shaking his head. Vitals? Good, Bobby replied. Just took a spike and then dipped for a moment. No kidding, Tom thought. You've got some time to ease him on through and ensure a good ride, but not too long, Bobby continued. Copy, Tom said, and ended the call. What did Dower say? Paul asked, looking at him. Have they figured out where to land this damn bird, or are we swimming up here? Tom looked at the younger version of Paul. He had never seen him in life like this. Even when Tom had been a boy, Paul had already been elderly. The memory of himself was entirely a projection of Paul's. Even still, despite the dream and change of appearance, Paul was looking at him with half-familiarity. That had been the whole point of the acclamation over the last few months, getting him familiar with the sight of Tom again, especially now that he was no longer a little kid, and imprinting that positive feeling of friendship deep down, beneath the conscious level, to the deep dive. That had been the whole point, at least for Paul. For Tom, it was more like coming back full circle, to close a very long, very sad, and very precious book. Tom shook his head at his friend's expectant face. Nothing new. Stay the course and hope we keep out of Jerry's way. Paul laughed and gestured to the clouds engulfing them outside. If they can see us, then let them try. As far as I'm concerned, we get a runway and we bolt for it. Viva la France. It was Tom's turn to laugh. Why France, he thought. In real life, Paul had never landed in France. And by all accounts of the plane they were in, France would have been occupied territory at this time, especially if the Germans had taken the space over the channel. None of it mattered, though. Not to that level of detail, anyways. Not at dive level. You have someone waiting for you in France? Tom prodded, knowing. At this point, Paul turned back to him, beaming. Oh, you bet I do. Sweetest girl out of the States. Hell, sweetest girl made anywhere, and I swear by it. My wife... He reached for a photograph that had suddenly appeared on the far end of the plane's console and showed it to Tom. This one was, or at least had been, in the real world outside. Tom had seen it many times, 
as it used to sit on Paul's desk. In it, Paul and his wife Francine were posed with their two children at an event sometime in the mid-80s. This version of Paul was a good 30 years older than the one he looked like now. But again, none of that mattered on a dive. Just the general details and the mind would fill in the blanks. She's beautiful, Tom said. You are a lucky man, Paul. Any kids? Paul shook his head, looking directly at the photograph of the family this version of him would one day have. Not yet. Maybe after the war. Find a nice spot somewhere up east. Sounds real nice, Tom said, doing his best to talk with his old friend like they used to. One last time. Is that where you're from? Again, the prodding, pre-planned question. Yep. Paul said, gingering the controls and reading the gauges while the white mist of the endless clouds swirled outside them. Grew up outside the city in the foothills. Nice little country town called Minister's Creek. How about you? Any family? Tom thought for a moment of Carolyn again. He thought of the discussions Paul and he had had during the last few months, both of them discussing their wives with the reverence of loss. But this deep Paul didn't remember. Lightning flashed outside, and a blast of sparks shot out of the control panel with a plume of smoke. Holy shit! Tom screamed, surprised, and a little scared for the first time since the dive started. The plane did a little wobble, and began to descend rapidly, as the gear in the cockpit began to rise, resisting the drop against gravity. Molasses on a knife, Paul said, and began jerking against the wheel with one arm, banging on the controls with the other. More smoke came out of the control box, and then flames. Tom's face was now full blast in the black acrid smog as dashes of hot orange flames licked upwards. Despite the unreality of it all, the flames felt hot and the whole sensation of the smoke felt far more compressive than it should have. It must be the pills, the thought drifted up between the panic. He unfastened his buckle and released himself from his seat, rising upwards as he did so. Get the damn chem spray, Paul said, his voice maintaining calm. In the back, in the back, the green can, now. Tom took a second, righted himself, and saw it. The green can was about as large as a big shoe and strapped to the wall. Tom held firm to his chair and grasped the thing by the top, pulling hard. It came loose, and he fell back into his seat, almost into the flames, before he pulled the cord and began spraying. Half expecting something like a fire extinguisher, he was surprised when instead the thing began to operate more like a vacuum cleaner, sucking up the smoke and flames with ease. Again, the effects of the dive could get weird, but this one gave him a little laugh. Once he'd finished sucking up the smoke and pulling in the flames, which at the end of the day, Tom thought, looked far more like strips of colored paper, he capped the canister again and set it aside. Great stuff, Paul said indicating the green can as Tom put it back. Army guys came up with it a few months back. Experimental model, but I think it's going to go commercial. Tom didn't know what to say to that, and so he just nodded as he took his seat again. She'll hold up, don't worry, Paul said, patting the aircraft with a sense of love. She's going to so I can see my Francine. That's a promise I'm going to keep. How about you? You were saying something... Anyone waiting for you? Tom felt a little lump in his throat, and he looked outside at the darkening clouds. Wife and two girls, he said after a moment. If we can make it to France and land this thing, I would really like to see them again. The plane hit some turbulence, and Paul steadied the craft against the gusts. How long has it been? Paul asked. Six years, Tom said, then corrected himself. Sorry, two just at the start of the war. He didn't know exactly what year Paul thought it was, and he hoped that his insertion wasn't going to spark any continuity issues. If that happened, the whole dive could begin to unravel or degrade to an unstructured state. Paul didn't seem to notice, however. Tom, what was that? A voice jumped in. Tom, do you read? All good, Bobby, Tom responded quickly. Don't get jumpy, just a little mechanical issue. After a moment, are you sure? That was really weird. It looked like you were having a reaction on your end, not from Mr. Corey's side. I'm fine. All good, Tom repeated. 
Keep me up to speed on any vital changes. We're still passing through, okay? Another moment. Sort of. Not too much longer on his end. If you have any closing matters to wrap up the dive, I'd start prepping the end narrative, and rip if you have to. Copy, Tom said, frowning. Color? Solid yellow, slipping red now, Bobby said. Seriously, not judging a pro, but this seems close, Tom. Copy, Tom said, and ended it, putting the receiver back in its place. Paul was looking at him. We good to go? He asked. Only one way now, Tom replied. As if on thought, and Tom supposed it was, two shadows descended from the thunderclouds. The sound of the engines picked up behind them, and another flash of sparks tore through the side of the plane. This time, a piece of metal scraped against Tom's leg, and he felt a stab of pain that almost could have been real. A moment later, the figure of two German planes swooped around the cockpit, turning. Sons of bitches! Paul shouted. They're trying to strafe us again! Tom looked down and saw a gash in his leg, blood pulsing. You good? Paul said, reaching out an arm. Hang on. The plane was arcing again, up hard, and then down, and to the left. The twin engines whined against the strain, and in the clouds it was impossible to see. Tom felt a stomach rise, and saw the little radio receiver dangle wildly toward the ceiling. Where are they? Paul called. Do you got a beat on them? This is impossible, Tom thought, briefly. And it was, true. But even more so, what was he looking for? The cloud was swirling around them, and the engines whined ceaselessly. Another sudden burst of sparks shattered the cockpit windows, and a hurricane was blowing in their faces. Paul was shouting furiously as the plane dove down and down. The clouds broke then, revealing an ocean of rolling black waves. It was nothing like the Atlantic, or any ocean in real life. The waves were ink and mercurial rising in sharp, angular crests before tumbling back down into an abyss of darkness. The pitch dark was swallowing up the horizon, and Tom felt a sense of real fear, of impending death, and a sense of regret for the first time. Not like this, he had time to think. Not like this. Then, perhaps out of the naked desperation of his own mind, instinctively his hand moved forward and gripped the second set of controls, the co-pilot controls, the ones that had not been there moments ago, but now suddenly seemed so right, and in unison with Paul, Tom pulled hard up on the stick, and the plane began to level out. It was close, a narrow drop, or a few seconds more, and they would have struck and then gone deep into the unknown. Instead, Tom watched as the dark horizon evened, and then the sun began to pierce the clouds. The receiver began to ring again, surely Bobby had noticed something was seriously off by now but Tom ignored it. He checked the time dilation and saw the number rising incrementally and knew the modifications on the device must have started to kick in when Paul's vitals dropped. Then he heard the engines again. Smooth flying, Ace, but they're still on us, Paul said. How bad is your leg? The glass paneling of the cockpit was still shattered, but against logic, Tom noticed that the wind was neither blowing against them or making any noise at all. Strange, but again, nothing too odd for a dive. Tom looked back down and saw that his leg, as well as his pants, were soaked in blood from where the roundest drape him. This was very unusual for a dream. He should have woken up by now, and guessed that the pills were doing their job too. I think I'm okay, he said, standing painfully as the plane hitched and bumped. Can you make it to the gun? Paul said, indicating the turret that was now mounted atop the plane. We need to fire back, or we can't shake these guys. We're ducks out here. Tom looked back out the cockpit and could see the green ahead, a distant blur on the edge of reality. Is that France? Tom asked. If we can shake the Jerry's, Paul said, then yeah, it's France. Otherwise, though, it's nothing. The engines behind them began their whine, and Tom wasted no more time. His math tutor now in his twenties again and dressed in pilot's gear from the Second World War, was manning the plane, and Tom needed to get to the gunner's seat. That's what was important now. He gingered his leg up the steps to the ladder, unusually aware of the pressure on his body, as he slumped into the seat and aimed the twin barrels. 
The whole thing looked far more like the inside of the Millennium Falcon than it did any real military plane, and Tom assumed that's because it was more his brain generating this part than Paul's. But at this point, he wasn't sure, and it didn't matter. Dipping out of the clouds, the two fighters came down in pursuit. The turret turned painfully, nightmarishly slow, as he leveled in on the first one. Just then, he saw the orange flashes of their guns, and a moment later, felt the shudder as his own plane took another direct shot. He squeezed the dual triggers and watched the guns around him flare, orange hissing rounds rising high into the sky. There was a sudden blast as the first fighter erupted into a ball of flames, and a thunderous clap followed a second later. Did you get him? He heard Paul shout in excitement. Yeah, Tom said. One down and... But before he could finish, the second one emerged. Bullets exploded around him. Tom cried out in surprise, and then the world spun as Paul flipped the plane. He felt the push of the engines under him, roaring him upwards again in some evasive maneuver. The other plane was leveling out behind them again. Paul bucked, down this time, and then up. Tom watched the black inky waters beneath them rise up to meet them and then push away again. How long would this last? How long could they keep this up? The metal beneath him was beginning to rattle hard, and the whole time Tom felt a pressure growing around him, pressing against his legs and his chest and his ears. It felt like he was being pressed into a tube and squeezed while being tossed about. Tom saw the shadow pass again, the other plane more agile and quick. It darted ahead. For a second, Tom thought perhaps it was simply going and gone, but knew it couldn't be true. It turned now, arcing back to level out at them head on. Tom tried to swivel the gun again and watched it turn horrifically slow. Come on, boy, it's now or never, Paul shouted. Ahead, the plane was hurtling at them, closing the distance faster than Tom could believe. He strained against the turret and thrust his weight against it. With one final push, he evened the gun forward. Now the fighter was close enough that Tom could see the pilot behind the glass. A grinning, bare, and bleached skull. White teeth beneath goggles and cap. And nothing more. Now! Paul shouted again. Tom lit the guns up a moment before the thing ahead crashed into them. The other plane disintegrated into pieces, blowing away in the wind and crashing into the darkness below. Sinking into the ink and vanishing. Hot grease! Paul said as Tom slid down the ladder. Hot grease on a skittle. That was some shooting, Tom. Tom froze, surprised at Paul's sudden recognition, and realized the other man looked different, too. His face was older now, still far younger than he had been, but older than the boy in the officer's uniform. He was the Paul who lived, the middle-aged man who used to be a pilot. Ahead, the green and grassy fields of what Tom assumed were supposed to be France were rapidly coming into view. Tom looked at the time dilation on his watch, and for the first time ever saw the message E-R-R. -R. It was the device's shorthand for error, he knew. Did we make it? Tom asked Paul. I think so, the other man said. Take a look. The plane crested over a chalk-colored cliff, above fields of green, and pointed its nose toward the runway that had formed ahead. There, gathering on the edge, was a little crowd of four figures. Two women and two little girls. I'm going to take us down, Paul said, then added, if that's all right with you. Tom put his hand on the other man's shoulder, feeling the fabric and the man underneath, the weight of the touch. He blinked his eyes and felt the air pass between his lips. Yeah, he said. That's all right. Maria came to the room, led by one of the nurses at the hospice center. The door was open, and a small team was removing the body of the patient, Mr. Corey. Bobby was sitting next to the chair where Tom was still laid out. Can you tell me what the hell happened here? She said, not wasting time. Did corporate explain? Bobby said, his voice cracking. A seizure? She said. I don't know, Bobby said, the words coming out in little bursts. He just, he just stopped breathing. I mean, they both did. Like, 
Instead of pulling out, he just synced up with him, with Mr. Corey as he went over. I mean, Jesus, Maria, I didn't think that could happen. Nowhere in the training docks did they say... She raised a hand. Did he pull his rip? No, Bobby stammered. But I couldn't. I mean, I really couldn't. There was something wrong with the override in the 97 model. Maria swore, then said, Did you check his bag? Was he taking the pills? Bobby raised an empty brown glass bottle, showing her the label side. He filled it out two days ago, a six-month stock, if he was running dives full-time, he said. Holy shit, Maria said. Well, that would explain the sinking with Mr. Corey. Would it? Bobby said, his voice raising. The pills sink mental state, she said, trying to sound reasonable, trying to figure out a rational way to explain this to the agency. It almost sounded right. The pills sink mental state, she said again, to herself now more than Bobby. If he OD'd and was sinking with Mr. Corey at the time of death, then yes, I suppose it's possible he went over the edge with him. Bobby stared at her, nodding vaguely. Then he shook his head and gave out a long sigh. I don't know, Bobby. It's the best I can make from this, she said. Then after a moment, what? What is it? It's the drive log. The one from the dive, Bobby said. Is it bad? Data get blown at the end? She said, not sure what else could go wrong tonight. Poor Bobby. She sure as hell didn't know why or how Tom screwed up this bad, but the kid was going to be lucky to keep his license, let alone his job. If there was any chance of him saving his career at the agency, he would need that log intact. Bobby shook his head. Take a look. Maria turned to the PC that was still plugged into the headset on Tom. She saw the older 97 model, something from when she was a trainee, retrieved the cold storage logs and linked them to the PC. It took her a moment, but then she saw the spike. What is that? she asked. The time dilation, Bobby said. And here, he pointed to the storage driver. Was it this full when you started? she asked. No, Bobby said. His voice sounded weak and far away now, like he was afraid of something. I wiped it before we started. Tom brought the Meridian 97 model. I'm guessing that's how he was able to override the safety rigs. But I wiped the drive myself. How long was the dive? Maria asked, her own voice on edge. Standard, Bobby answered. Little under an hour. Maria paused, looking, trying to make sense of what she was seeing in the data. Time dilation had spiked there at the end, almost exponentially. Bobby, these drives record for, what, 30 hours, top end? Her voice trailed. She honestly didn't know how long they could record for. She had never actually seen it happen. And that's what the manual says, Bobby chimed. So, Tom what? Was in the chair for an hour, and the data clocked out? <laughs> that's some time dilation, she said. Y yeah, full time. 30 hours, and that was just when it stopped recording, he said. You ever see anything like that? Maria shook her head, looking at what she was seeing, but not understanding. And it's not just garble, Bobby said, pointing to a highlighted section of the vertical arc and zooming in to reveal peaks and valleys. It's all conscious thought, still going up until the recording ran out of room. And I'm not sure the dive actually stopped then. I think it just stopped recording. But Bobby, Maria said, sounding sad and confused. He was dead at that point. Bobby didn't ask the question. He couldn't quite form it if he tried. But the answer to that impossible thought, he knew, was sitting in front of them, displayed on the screen, and laying in the body in the chair beside them. Thank you very much for listening. Your thoughts and time are very valuable, so thank you for choosing to spend some of it here with me. Wherever you are out there, know that you are not alone and that we will be here to keep telling stories through the night. If you enjoyed the story, 
please like and subscribe, and tell friends and family who like this sort of stuff. As an independent writer and artist, producing these works takes a ton of time and effort, done purely from a passion to tell stories. If you want to support me directly, please consider checking out my other works at www.fictionalpage.com, or become a patron at patreon slash fictionalpage, or use the links below. Thanks for listening, and until next time.